We are Motorhead, and we're gonna kick your ass. If I had to pick one single lyric, my favorite, yeah. Orgasmatron. I am the one, Orgasmatron, the outstretched, grasping hand. My image is of agony, my servants rape the land. Obsequious and arrogant, clandestine and vain. A thousand years of misery and torture in my name. Hypocrisy made paramount, paranoia of the law. My name is called religion, sadistic, sacred whore. I twist the truth, I rule the world, my crown is called deceit. I am the emperor of lies, I gro uh, they grovel at my feet. I rub you and I slaughter you, your downfall is my game. And still you play the psychophant and revel in your pain. Um, I might be screwing a little bit of it up. The thing that I admired about them, even growing up uh, before I knew them or before I really knew that much about them even, was that they didn't waver. They never changed. They, they were who they were. And they always they always stayed that way. I remember thinking when uh, when Metallica first got really big, and you know everybody was like, "Man, they're so different because they're not that glam. They just go out on stage in jeans and t-shirts and play." And I'm thinking like like Motorhead. You know what I mean? That that's they're like the newer version of of that in a way. They made the music that they liked to make, and they had the sound that they liked to have, and they had the look that they liked to have, and they didn't change it for anybody. No record label told them you need to you know spray your hair up real big, no record company told them you need to change your sound to be more mainstream. They did what they did, and, and whether they were successful or not, and I think that's why they have a, a, such a big cult following um, among you know fans. It, it seems like Motorhead is kind of one of those things where like you either love them or you couldn't give a shit about them, you know? and, and uh, I think that's because of their image. They, they don't care whether you like them or not. They're gonna make and do what they do, and that's it. Like eight years ago or so, um, I was in a, a period of time with my career where I was moving up and becoming a. a well, I had become a, a major star within the industry and, and one of the top performers, and I wanted new music, um, something that was more fitting to what I was doing. I wanted to have a certain vibe when I walked out, and that vibe to me was what Motorhead was. It was what my character was. It wasn't. I wasn't the. The pristine, pretty boy. I wasn't the um, the nice guy anymore. I was rough and tumble, and my face is scarred up. And um, you know, when I'm out there, I'm all taped up, and I'm injured, and I'm I'm fighting people and kicking ass and hitting them with a sledgehammer and you know busting them open. And I mean, that's my that is my image. And that I felt like that was you know the 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 sound of Motorhead was. Um, helped to convey that. The game was written by our music guy and, and you know, Lem obviously put his twist on it and, and they played it and stuff, but the difference between when they played it to me and gave me the, the, the first cut of it from the studio and stuff to what Lem did was, it was a totally different song, you know what I mean? And, and uh, the first time I heard it, I was like, fuck yeah, that's, that is me right there, you know what I mean? And, and uh, th that's how Lem did it. Lem didn't know who I was. They said, you know, we got the call from these wrestling guys and want you guys to record this song. They're willing to pay us this, okay, <laughs> you know? Um, and Lem said he went in there and they played him the song and he was like, this is fucking terrible. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't like this. I don't want to play this. Like, what, what is this guy? Like, well, give me a. And so they, he said they showed him some pictures of me. I don't remember if they showed him a video, but they showed him pictures of like me, like doing really intense stuff where he was like, "Fuck, all right, I'll do that." You know what I mean? And he made that sound. And um, I think that's why it works so well for me. You know, the the song does. But the songs for us. It's that immediate emotional rush when a fan um, is in the arena. You know and there's whatever, 70,000 people or whatever it is, and that first chord of my music hits and you hear Lem say, time to play the game. You know, everybody stands up, shit's on. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge moment and everybody's music is that way. But I, I mean, I'm biased, but I feel like I have the most powerful music in the, in the business, you know what I mean? And it's because of them. But uh, you know, since then they've played me to the ring a few times, which much to Lem's dismay, he, he constantly makes the point that every time they've played me to the ring, I've lost. You know, and almost every time he comes to see me, I lose. So he's like, I think I'm a bad luck charm for you, you know, or something. But, uh, you know, he's not a, a big wrestling fan, so he just sits in his limo outside and, and he waits uh, in the in the underneath parking area and at Staples Center. He just waits in his car and they come and get him the match before mine. They bring him out to the crowd and they put him in a seat and he waits, he watches my match and I talk to him for a second and then he leaves and tells me I'll be in my car when you're done, you know, and I go grab a shower or do whatever and come out and sit in the car and we bullshit for a while and talk and he always brings me some kind of new demo he's working on or something and 
So it's, it's been a very cool relationship. There's a definite parallel in our business to that business in, in, in that, um, you know, we also, we run the gamut of people who love us or hate us. You know, um, there's also like you, like you were saying, the parallel of, of um, you know, the image of what you are, you know, and people judging a book by its cover when you say, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a wrestler for the WWE or something. Oh, he must be a genius. You know what I mean? And, and or, or they just have a, di a different opinion of, of what you what you are and what you, you know, I've, I've done movies in Hollywood and um, done other TV shows and stuff like that. And every time I do it, it's almost at the end, they're almost the same. Like, God, we were really impressed. We didn't really expect, like, you know, you to be intelligent and, you know, like, I think they thought I was going to go in there like, mm, me, do show, you know, or something like that. And I think they think the same with Lem, you know, it's, it's, um, I know when I first met him, you know, I really didn't know what to expect. You know, here you see this, you know, this gravelly voiced guy that, that looks like he's been through, uh, through the ringer a few times, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, and not that Lem's the most attractive guy in the world to start with, although he does fairly well with the naked chicks, as I see regularly when I see him. Uh, he's always got a different broad with him. But, um, you know, it, I think people expect one thing when they see him, but when you talk to him and when you actually sit down and talk to him, he's very smart, man. He's very, uh, like I say, he's almost philosophical sometimes, the way he says things, but it's very simplified. You know, it's it's almost, a, he doesn't say a lot, but when he does, it's almost like... Uh, well, he summed that all up pretty well. You know what I mean? It's um, he's uh, he's definitely a, a guy that you can't judge a book by its cover. I think there's a similarity of that to, to us too. You know, in, in in our business, just of the, of that image is is always out there. People have a preconceived notion of what we are. You know, and and uh, I think they do of of Lem, and I think they do of Motorhead as well. You know, most people that are oh, Motorhead, they've never even heard the band. You know. At WrestleMania, whew, not sure which one. Uh, I think it was Seattle. I think we were at the the uh, the big dome in Seattle, and they played. And um, what I what I remember about that gig was they showed up for rehearsals probably sometime early afternoon, like one o'clock or something, and they looked like hell. You know, Lemmy was all shaking like a leaf, and. Uh, you know, they'd been out all night on some bender and, and you know, came in and, and uh, they were a wreck. And uh, they, you know, they played the song when they recorded it and they hadn't played it since then. And Todd had been trying to get Lemmy to listen to it, to, to memorize it, and he hadn't. And, like, so they got up there and they're trying to play the song and they're fighting like little kids, like, fuck you, you don't even know how to play the fucking thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're trying to play it. And to the point where Kevin Dunn, our director, gets me on a headset and he's like, um... Should we just pull the plug on this thing? Like, this is, I don't know if we should take the chance of this. This is embarrassing. Like, it's going to be embarrassing for you, maybe. And I said, no, you know, I talked to Todd, and Todd was like, you know, sorry, they're just, they need to get right, you know what I mean? And, and it'll be fine tonight, you know? And I said, let's take his word for it, and, you know, I, I think it'll be okay, you know? And, and even Lem had said to me, he's like, ah, you know, no, I don't pay no attention to what we're doing now. It'll be fine tonight, don't worry. When, when, it, when it's time, I'll be ready. And, um... So, but I was really nervous about it, you know, like, these guys, I hope they don't, you know, they because I didn't know them, and I thought, like, man, they're not even taking this shit seriously, and there's going to be, I think we had, like, 80,000 people there, and, you know, it's like our Super Bowl, right? And uh, so I remember I went in their room shortly thereafter, like, in their, like, I, I, one of the things I noticed, I walked in the room, and there was, like, a little pack of, like, luncheon meat, and then, like, booze. Like, their whole rider was just booze, like, all... <laughs> you know, and I thought, like, oh, that's, um, there's, like, a loaf of bread, some ham or something like that, and, and a fucking big thing of booze and shit. I thought, well, that ought to help, you know. So then I left, and then I came back, like, maybe two matches before mine and uh, just to go in there and say, hey, guys, let's, you know, let's fucking kick some ass and stuff. And I went in there, and, like, almost all the booze was gone. It was, like, just all spread out, the bottles on the floor and shit in the trash. There was, like, a couple left on the thing, you know, and, like, two loaves, two pieces of bread were gone, you know. <laughs> And, uh, but they were like different people. You know, Lem was going a thousand miles an hour now. He was like, ready to fuck, yeah, let's do it. You know what I mean? And they were all up and um, we went out there and they, you know, and then they kicked ass, you know. But I remember leaving the room thinking, like, all right, this is going to be okay. Like, they're different people. Like, I see what the guy was, like, Todd was talking about now. Like, they needed to get their shit, they needed to get back on the, <laughs> on the train to, to get to where they needed to be. And, and once they did, I mean, it was awesome. You know, they played me to the ring and, uh, 
worked out well. Lem didn't know any of the lyrics, but that worked out okay. You know what I mean? Nobody really could tell but me. You know, I'll get people bring me Motorhead stuff to sign. I get fan, uh, I actually was gonna wear one today. Like, I get fans all the time, like when I'm overseas, especially. Um, fans bring me Motorhead shirts from the tours that they were on. Like I have ones from, uh, you know, with the upside down writing from their Australia tour from last time they were there. Fans just brought me, you know, into the towns and stuff. They're always asking me to sign stuff from Motorhead or, you know, I'll get pictures with, you know, the whole band is signed. They want me to sign it too. and. Um, I get that a lot, and especially in places like I can tell where they're really big, you know, still like, like when we go to Germany, um, it's funny, we were there maybe for about a year and a half or two years ago or something like that, and uh, they had done this new song, King of Kings, for me, which I still use the game song, but what they were doing was a lead-in with the King of Kings song and then breaking into the other song, so they would play for about maybe like a... I don't know, 45 seconds of the King of Kings song and the whole play, like they, they knew the lyrics. It had just come out like that month. And uh, they were all chanting the lyrics and like the whole place, it looked like a concert. You know, like I was standing in the back looking through the curtain thinking, holy shit, how do they know this? You know what I mean? And they were all just like doing the stuff to the song. It was it was amazing, you know, but they're, they're, they're big there, you know, I mean, I mean, people react to the music, but that was, I mean, they were reacting solely to Motorhead at that point in time. It wasn't even because I was coming out, you know, in certain places. I mean, I'll see 50 signs in the crowd, you know, for Motorhead or for, you know, for me and Motorhead or for, you know, their shirts or stuff like that, you know what I mean? You know, it's it's just a funny thing. Like fans for us, you know, it's, I'm sure as they do for them too, they bring us, you know, they bring you little knickknacks or gifts or something like that. And, you know, I get Motorhead stuff all the time from Japan. I get Motorhead stuff all the time from like Australia. You know, Germany fans are always bringing stuff. You know, Europe especially, it seems like it's really big there. Yeah. And I, I just did, a, we just opened up a uh, an office in Brazil. <clears throat> and... Uh, so I, I did a, a media tour, like where they brought in a whole bunch of their media from Brazil in to uh, talk to me, and I did like four interviews with four different like uh, TV, big TV stations, like you know, really big stuff for there. And the first question all four asked me was, um, "Is it true that you and Lemmy from Motorhead are very close friends?" That was the first question they asked me every each time. You know what I mean? You know, to be associated with that is big for me, but I think at the same point in time for them, we've. You know, we're huge with kids and teenagers and stuff like that. And I think, you know, we've turned, I know even just my nephew who would have never picked up on Motorhead. It was just wasn't around him. All his friends were into hip hop and all that stuff. And, you know, he's, I know he's probably got 10 Motorhead songs in his iPod because, just because of that, because he likes my music, my entrance music. So he goes online and finds songs that he likes from them, you know, and uh, if you look at it honestly, Lem 62, he shouldn't be doing what he does. He shouldn't be rock and rolling. He shouldn't be on stage, you know, uh, playing the kind of music he does, especially. I mean, it's just, it's crazy, you know, but that's who he is. And, and I admire that, man. I admire that. It's, I mean, you see it in a band, you see it in his music, you see it in his life. He doesn't waver. He is who he is. And that's the fucking, it's going to be that way until the day he no longer is. You know, he's, he's, he's just going to be Lem and he's going to be fucking, playing the music he wants to play and, you know, doing the things he wants to do and the chicks he wants to do and all of it, and it's just going to continue to go until one day it's just gone.